this is our institute. Um, this is my life story. Um, bachelor's at Princeton, an MD at Johns Hopkins, intern U of Chicago, residency at Rush, sports medicine fellowship at Harvard and Mass General. I was assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Rush for 27 years before st uh, stepping back to mostly do regenerative medicine. Um, my practice is now devoted to world leading stem cell treatment longevity and we do a lot of PRP. I um, am editor of the textbook on the ACL for orthopedic surgeons, although I stopped doing surgery about a year and a half ago. I'm a board certified orthopedic surgeon. I got into stem cells. Uh, I started doing platelet rich plasma and it worked well. Started doing stem cell work the way they would let us do it in the US and it was a little better, but there were limitations. Um, I became aware that there were better treatments available outside the US that we are not allowed to do here. Started doing them for osteoarthritis, I had great success, branched out to inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. And our goal now is just to bring this to everybody um, who needs it, regardless of their diagnosis. And for things that I'm not conversant in, we have experts who we work with. Um, the USA and Western Europe do not allow stem cell treatment except for very small studies, which are generally virtually impossible to get into. We are able to offer state-of-the-art clinics and treatment in Antigua and now as of last month in Athens, Greece, where regulations are more favorable. We evaluate patients remotely from all over the world and in person in Chicago. I'm in Chicago three weeks a month. I come to Naples once a month for four or five days, have been doing so for eight or ten years, um, and then we treat them at one of those two sites. Um, this is our place in Athens. We have this um, lady from New York who comes down and she was going to, supposed to go to Antigua next month, which is easy to get to from New York, but she said, I want to go to Athens. So she's coming there in, um, in June instead. Um, so we use culture expanded stem cells from umbilical cords donated post-term cesarean section. So they are not fetal, they're not embryonic, there are no ethical issues from Vitro Biopharma in Golden, Colorado in the US. By the way, um, I'd encourage all of you to take a card. You may throw it away, but our website's on there. And there's all kinds of stuff, including all of this on our website. They are completely safe with no adverse events after having, ever having been seen with their use. They do not have HLA type 2 antigens, which cause rejection, and therefore are not rejected and do not need to be tissue matched. They can be used in anyone. They are FDA approved for use in human patients unlike the case at most other centers. We typically inject about 200 million cells intravenously into people. Bone marrow aspirate, in contrast, only has about 80,000 cells and is no more effective than PRP or platelet-rich plasma. I bring this up because bone marrow aspirate is the only legal stem cell treatment in the United States. And it works for joints like PRP, but it doesn't work for these other problems. It is offered to people um, and I know we, we did a hundred patients with this and other things. We did kind of everything that we were allowed to do and the results were underwhelming. Um, SVF, stromal vascular fraction fat. This is something where you take fat out, digest it with an enzyme and put it back. It's only about 8% stem cells. So we know about every treatment. I've used them all, tried them all and cultured umbilical stem cells are the state of the art worldwide and they're used all over. The places where they're markedly less used are not used at all is the United States and Western Europe. Tony Robbins um, <clears throat> uh, came to us in Antigua. Uh, they were trying stem cells for their clients at Fountain Life and he said he liked us. He put me, us into his book, um, Life Force, which is a best-selling book and he writes in part, the passion for preserving rather than replacing joints led him to becoming a world leader in the use of stem cells to avoid uh, joint replacement for um, osteoarthritis. Stem cells are administered IV. Everybody gets them in intravenously, even if you're getting them injected locally for a joint or for hair or whatnot. The stem cells IV find areas of inflammation that we can't um, necessarily find with a needle. 
Um, for arthritis, sports injuries, they're also injected into the joints, usually. For back and neck pain, they're injected into the epidural space and facet joints. I'll talk about this a little. For erectile dysfunction into the penis. For the rest of this, um, uh, which actually doesn't seem to hurt, um, I had, for whoever grimaced, I had a patient come down, we injected his knees, we injected IV for asthma, he had a penis injection and another joint, and he said, you know, the only thing that didn't hurt at all was that, so whatever. Um, um, for the rest of this talk, I will talk about many of the conditions for which stem cells are useful. It is only a partial list, but will give you an idea of the power of this treatment. So I'm gonna talk about sports medicine first. We do a lot of professional athletes, particularly NFL players. We don't talk about them um, for privacy reasons, except some of them want to tell their story. And so I'm gonna tell you here in a minute about some of them. Um, we have four, I have four Pro Bowl players who told me they're having their best season ever. Can't tell you who they are, but this is Ryan Jensen. Ryan was Tom Brady's center. He was on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He had a horrible knee injury um, in, uh, a year ago, it was July of 22. And his, uh, he, he tore three ligaments in his knee, a meniscus, a little fracture in his tibia. Um, and um, the, the, they called me, actually his agent had him call me to ask if stem cells would help after surgery. And I told him, so I'm an orthopedic surgeon, I, editor of the textbook on the ACL, done it my whole adult life. And the story is, if you get that bad an injury and you operate, the results are often not very good. You get a lot of scar tissue and whatnot. And furthermore, two of those three ligaments, if you give them a chance, the PCL and the MCL will heal on their own. Um, so you have to not be too quick to just operate for that. So I told him, I said, he shouldn't have surgery at all. He should, the PCL and the MCL almost always heal. And then you can go back later and clean up the ACL, which is a much more predictable operation. So they talked to five other doctors. All five recommended surgery. I was the only one who didn't. Um, and um, he actually, there's a YouTube video where he describes this. Um, so he decided to go with us. He was treated. I actually sent him to a colleague of mine who wrote the papers on this because I had just stopped operating and didn't think I could fix his ACL if it needed it. So after um, three months, his PCL and MCL healed completely. And interestingly, his ACL healed too, which usually doesn't happen, which means that the MRI was a little bit wrong. There were some remaining fibers. So then we brought him to Antigua and we gave him intravenous stem cells to help the ligaments heal more robustly. But I told him, I said, this is a two year fix. Forget about this year. You, you should be good, but next year. So then he went back, it's four months out and he was looking good and he went to camp and his teammates said, you know, you're looking good. Can you play this year? And I told him not to, I said, it's too soon. And um, to make a long story short, he did it anyway. And uh, five and a half months after this horrific injury, he played in the game, did not re-injure himself. So he said, I need to tell the story so other people can be helped. So what I'm telling you is available online. It's the Athletic and National Publication. And I'm only telling you the story because he wanted to tell it. Uh, this is a Greek skier. Um, uh, international ski racer, had six operations on his knee. The knee was kind of a mess. He said, um, we injected it with stem cells in his knees and IV. And then he wrote, this is like a year later, just wanted to thank you again for the injections. We are able to write some ski racing history the other day by becoming the first Greek to podium at a world championship event in ski racing. Thank you again um, uh, times a million. So ski racer, uh, this is Kirk Cousins. Um, Kirk. Um, as you probably know, is a Pro Bowl quarterback, just signed with the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, great quarterback, even better person. Um, and he tore his Achilles tendon. And he called and asked what I would recommend when he did it. And I recommended that he have surgery, which I you know, don't do. Um, and he got it fixed. But then he came to us to have stem cell treatment, which should help the Achilles to heal more robustly. Um, he has a lot of career ahead of him. Um, this is a picture, um, he came to Antigua. And again, he wanted to tell the story. Actually, NFL Films came with him and they're doing, a, I think, another story on, on his rehab. So this will be part of it. This actually wound up being on the national media here on a TV station as well. Um, so these are people I can talk to you about. There are um, many more who I can't. Um, so, stem cells for osteoarthritis of any joint. More than 80% of patients with severe arthritis of the knee, shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, and ankle can be effectively treated with stem cell injections in, instead of surgery, even bone on bone. Now, a couple of people mentioned the hip. The hip is the one joint we have good success with early and moderate, but bone on bone, stiff hips, it really doesn't work, and, um, um, and I generally don't do it. There is a technique 
that a doctor in South America is doing, which shows some premise and promise. It's more expensive. We've sent four people down. Two have gotten better. Two have not. Um, but for the simple stem cell injections in Antigua, we can do virtually any joint, no matter how severe. Um, not all joints of all severity do well, but we have data on all of this, and we give people a pretty good idea. Um, but, you know, except for the hip, and you'll see a video about this. Um, arthroscopic surgery is ineffective in patients over 50 in general. There are some exceptions, but it can make patients worse, should not be done. I spent my entire adult life, 38 years as an orthopedic surgeon, sticking scopes into people's knees and, and um, shoulders. And I can tell you that you go to an orthopedic surgeon and they say you've got a meniscus tear and you're 55 and we'll clean it up. It's, studies have shown it doesn't do any good and can even make you worse. So I never did it, but it's still done. Um, cortisone destroys cartilage and should never be injected for osteoarthritis. And I'll talk a little more about this. NSAID pills, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, ibuprofen, naproxen, Aleve, diclofenac, Celebrex, interfere with healing and in my opinion should also not be used. Physical therapy. Strengthening can help, but can also make joints worse. And almost all the patients we see have had physical therapy and it makes it worse. It has to be done carefully. You can emphasize core strengthening, quadriceps strengthening should be avoided. People are told that if you strengthen the muscles around the joint, it takes stress off of the joint. It doesn't, it's nonsense. It's the reverse of that. When you contract a muscle, it, it, it compresses the joint ends together and these inflamed joint ends hate that. So why is it done a lot? I guess because there isn't much else to do for many people and there's supply and demand. There's an awful lot of supply of this. Um, so we believe people should exercise. We put people on exercise programs. We have a whole other website to help them do that. But doing squats for your knees if you have arthritis is a horrible idea. It makes people worse routinely. Um, and it's true for all of these things. We teach people, like I said, how to, to, how to exercise. But to go to a PT with arthritis and expect to get better, it happens here and there, but almost always it makes um, people worse. So one of the first things we do is get them to stop doing the things that are aggravating it. Nothing against the great physical therapists out there, um, but um, th the whole premise is flawed. There's, there's nothing about a muscle that has anything to do with the inside of a joint. You know, they're, they're separate structures. But by the way, I have very famous NFL athletes, a couple of people who you would, a lot of people who you would know right away, and we tell them the same thing. Um, who I, I see it routinely. I have Pro Bowl players, um, a couple of them with bad knees, one with a groin, one with a calf. All of them were doing strengthening, stopped it, and all of them gave them stem cells, and they all got better. So this isn't just um, you know, regular folks. Cortisone. Cortisone clearly kills tendon and cartilage. Getting cortisone shots increases the chance you will need joint replacement surgery and tendon surgery. In my opinion, it should never be injected into joints and tendons. It causes destructive knee changes and increases the need for knee replacement. It also increases the incidence of infections after surgery if surgery is done within six months or a year after the shot. I never use it for joints or tendons. Those who do, and most orthopedists do, I'm in the, in the minority here, um, would not dispute the above because it's very clear in the literature. There are really good scientific papers clearly showing that your chances of needing a knee replacement are higher if you get a cortisone shot. Increases the incidence of avascular necrosis, all kinds of things. Um, most other pediatric surgeons will say, yeah, it does that, but it's really not that bad. Um, but be aware that joint replacement is the tool that they are primarily purveying. So I will tell you, there's excellent data. We had a patient whose hip joint was destroyed, totally destroyed, it's remarkable, in one month by a, a single cortisone shot. And there's articles on this. So don't, don't, I'm just telling you, don't get a cortisone shot into a joint. Um, and um, if you have tendon problems, rotator cuffs and whatnot, which again, I spent, that's the main operation I did, is fix rotator cuffs, cortisone, I had one patient, I'll never forget, 37-year-old female, and people that age and females never get uh, these problems. So she went to a workers' comp clinic, shoulder pain therapy didn't help, gave her a cortisone shot. And it got, a, got an MRI, partial tear, um, cortisone shot, went, got better, got worse, went back again, another cortisone shot, got better, got worse. The doc sent her to me to fix it. We got another MRI completely torn. Without question, it was the cortisone that did it. Okay, this is a Neapolitan. She filmed this six months after being treated. I will tell you, she's out to two years now with the same results. I was diagnosed with bilateral arthritis and uh, spoke with several excellent doctors here in Naples, uh, but was never given a 
good option in terms of treatment other than let me know when you need surgery. I have a wonderful trainer who kept encouraging me to, to look into stem cell therapy because he knew of so many athletes that had benefited from that. And um, none of the surgeons, again, that I spoke with uh, previously had even mentioned that option. And I was fortunate enough to have a friend who had had a uh, PRP injection from Dr. Perdromos. And she said, I know he does stem cell treatments. And I was very fortunate, called Dr. Perdromos. He was going to be in town in the next couple of weeks. And I was able to get in to see him. The difference in the treatments uh, of stem cell in the United States versus outside is that they can be, uh, you can receive many more stem cells and it can be much more effective. Uh, so Dr. Pedromos gave me the option of going out of the country to have the stem cell treatment, uh, which we did. Uh, the procedure was a uh, very smooth operation. Uh, it was, I wouldn't call it painful. It was maybe a little uncomfortable, but it was a fairly easy uh, treatment process, which was very nice. The recovery uh, time was minimal. I took it easy for the first week, and then after that I gradually was able to just ease myself back into my activities, which involved uh, workouts, golf, everyday activities, as I felt comfortable doing that. It's been about six, six full months now since my treatment, so I think I'm at a full benefit uh, from this point at this point uh, from the treatment so totally different from prior to the treatment I, I played golf this morning shot a 79 I can play golf as often as I want without any pain or discomfort which is incredible I easily get through my workouts now they were more of a grind in terms of trying to find positions where I could do things and not feel pain Stem cell therapy is life-changing. Uh, the research that Dr. Prodromos is doing is extraordinary. He has uh, certainly changed my life, and I'm sure many others who I haven't had the opportunity to meet. There's a healthy big toe. This is a painful big toe. This um, sent me by rheumatologist. He had multiple cortisone injections. So I don't know if you can see, you see, see the space between the two bones there? I don't know. So, nothing. There's not, even, not, not only no joint space, there's just no joint, completely gone. And it hurts him a lot. And he, um, and I told him, I said, I don't know if this can help. Good chance, but can't. And he was, his patient came down for other things. This was two weeks ago. We did him. Um, and, um, and he's pain-free, completely pain-free in that. So, and I think he's going to stay that way, at least for a long time. But that's, that's what cortisone does to joints. We've had excellent success treating back and neck pain even after failed surgery in more than 50 patients. Our clinical trial has been submitted for publication. Results are comparable to surgery, but with no serious adverse events, minimal pain, recovery in one week or less, and no sedation needed. We perform in Antigua and now in Athens, Greece by excellent pain doctor specialists. Uh, we are very excited about this because um, Failed back patients have really no place to go. A lot of them wind up with pain stimulators and drugs and all kinds of stuff. And this, and it takes a long recovery, these people in a week feel okay. And about 70% of them do well at a year, back and neck, which is about the same as surgery, but with, with, with no side effects. So even more than other joints, you know, if you have a bad knee, you can get a knee replacement. And a lot of, some of them don't do so well, but most of them do okay. But you, you can't do a back replacement. So we're, we're very excited about this. This paper has been submitted for publication. It's very data intensive. Um, we looked at everything. It's very interesting too, no matter what there was, herniated disc, decreased disc space, spondylolisthesis with a bone slip, uh, ligamentum flavum, hypertrophy, you name it. It was all about the same. We even had nine patients with failed back surgery. Eight of them have follow-up of more than six months and seven of the eight got much better. And that, that really surprised us, because usually there's nothing you can do for failed back surgery in general. So we are, we are very excited about this. Anti-aging. 85% of our patients who had noticed problems in these areas, short-term memory, brain fog, before stem cell treatment, have substantial improvement afterward. We follow up all of our patients. So this is actual data that we get. Uh, we are the, one of the only stem cell centers in the world carrying out 
an actual publishable research study in this area. Um, if anybody else is, I, I don't know about it. What this is, we look at what's called DNA epigenetics, uh, which is uh, telomere length and DNA methylation. You guys may be familiar with this stuff. And it gives you a physiologic age to go along with the chronologic age. It looks at it's called the mitotic index of your DNA. It's an index of DNA stability, which we think correlates with risk of cancer. And not all of our patients, but most of our patients um, have gotten better after this. So this, and we're, we've, I forget how many people, I think we've got 27 before and after, we've got another 30 in the pipeline. So we're getting better data, and we're trying to figure out, most people do better, some don't. We're, we're kind of trying to figure out who does, who doesn't, one thing and another. But this is pretty good, um, um, pretty good evidence. I'm here, this is my second treatment. Um, I live in chronic pain. I came down here to uh, Antigua about two months ago. I received my first treatment and my pain went from about a seven to a two. So I'm here again to do it again to keep the momentum going. Dr. Padromas is excellent. Everything is very smooth to the point. You know, um, the injections are no problem. The IV is no problem. You know, there's really no problem. Everything is smooth here. The resort is beautiful. I'm pretty in tune with my body, and when they did these stem cells, they do 50 million at a clip through an IV. And I was just laying there, and all of a sudden, I felt my lungs opening up. I just took a breath, and I just kept just inhaling. I was able to inhale more and more and more. And I says, oh my God, I said, this stuff is working right now. 100% go with vitro biopharma, the aloe RX stem cells. These are definitely probably the best in the world. And uh, I would definitely recommend Dr. Padromas and coming down to uh, Antigua. I did this eight weeks ago. I f I'm totally different. My energy level went from a, a two to a seven. I I'm, I'm good. Very, that's why I'm here again. I want to keep the momentum going. And I plan on doing it again probably next year, maybe in May. I'll, I'll, I'll do this again and probably once a year for the rest of my life. So I mentioned the DNA um, um, epigenetics. So, you know, we try to get data where we can. Subjective data matters. Objective data is even better. Ed Eduardo Maristani, MD, is an anti-aging expert. He's the medical director of the Naples Center for Functional Medicine. He is board certified in internal medicine. He is certified in functional medicine. He's a fantastic doctor. I send patients to him from all over the country. He is nice enough to squeeze them in because I'm his friend into his busy schedule. He came to Antigua and discusses his personal results after mesenchymal stem cell treatment in um, Antigua provided by us. I have an aura ring, which is how I track my sleep and my heart rate variability and a lot of other biometrics. And I've had two and a half years of data on this aura ring. And just to give you an example, within two and a half years, on average, I average one hour of deep sleep per night, which is pretty standard for most Americans. An hour of deep sleep is enough. So in a seven hour sleep window, if you get one hour of deep restorative sleep, you typically feel pretty good and pretty rested. But children, a toddler, they get four, five, six hours of deep sleep. And that's why they're growing so fast and regenerating. As an adult, you typically can't get more than an hour and a half. It's kind of tough. So on the best day, two and a half years of data, I got two hours of deep sleep. Two hours, 15 minutes was the best I ever recorded. The day after stem cells, I had four hours of deep sleep. So the Aura Ring's been tracking my HRV for two and a half years, and I go anywhere between 20 on a bad day to 45 on a good day. Um, 45 being a better day. I've never gone over 70, ever, two and a half years. Um, the day after stem cells, I was 100. My heart rate was 100. And the day after that, it was 80. And the day after that, it was 60. And until then, I'm averaging now maybe 30 to 50, which compared to my previous average is way higher. And so there's no question that the stem cells actually rejuvenate your heart, even how your heart responds to stress. What's the most bizarre to me is after stem cells, when I went go for a run, so, you know, my heart rate variability was so much improved. It's like if I was 20 years old. Skin and hair rejuvenation. So stem cells reliably increase hair thickness. They won't do it if you're bald, if the follicles are dead. But for ladies, it helps in everybody we've done substantially. And for men who have hair, um, 
but thinning, here's loss of a widow peak, widow peak restored pretty quickly actually. Um, this is really an interesting story. This is a 28 year old young woman who came to us because her hair was kind of thinning and it wasn't real noticeable and she covered it up, but it bothered her. And you could see this is her before. So she came in twice because um, she said once it help, she wanted to come in for another one. And this is her, this is after the first one. She's a year and a half now and her hair is great. But let me tell you the, the rest of the story on her, which is really interesting. In her health history, she was very fit. She was a tennis champion, looked great. Um, but she had polycystic ovary syndrome, diagnosed by a gynecologist. So her periods were irregular. She only had eight or nine a year. She, and this had been since menarche at age of 16. Um, her hormones were a little abnormal, uh, progesterone as I recall, and ultrasound showed polycystic ovaries. And some people with that get thinning hair. It's probably why she had this and they can get other problems, which actually she didn't have. Um, so we follow up people very closely with our research people. So two months later, a research guy says, you know, she said that her periods these last two months have been completely regular, monthly, which had never happened in her life. And so following up, um, so her periods got regular, stayed regular, and they're still regular. So we thought, wow, that's interesting. So I thought, hmm, you know, why don't we do some hormone levels and see? So I forget when, six, eight months afterwards, maybe we got hormone levels and her hormones were completely normal, which they had not been before. They were never bad enough to treat according to her doctor, but they were abnormal. Now they were normal. So I thought, wow, you know, I wonder, so we got an ultrasound. And, um, and it turns out the cysts were gone from her ovaries too. This is like a year later. So, you know, kind of mind boggling. And this is not a coincidence after all these years. So clearly the stem cells made it go away. And why would they do that? Well, stem cells are powerfully anti-inflammatory. They're like cortisone, but without the side effects. And I didn't know much about this actually, but I researched it. We talked to some people in the field who said it turns out that PCOS is thought to be an inflammatory problem. Um, and um, uh, so it seemed to get rid of it. So we're act actively actually looking for other people. It turns out it's a very common disorder, no real good treatment for it. And who knows, maybe, I mean, I hate to talk like this, but who knows, maybe this is a cure for PCOS. And she's 15 months now and, and we haven't gotten other blood tests, but her periods are still completely irregular. So, um, and this is, we see this stuff in following up people, things that were kind of unexpected. But getting back to the first, we get ladies and men um, who actually will get um, this for their hair. We do a micro needling for their skin. Um, I don't do it, I've got a doctor who does it, and then massage in stem cells. So it makes your skin remarkably better and it makes your hair thicker just about in every case. People do this with PRP too. We actually did that for a little bit. My, a bit my wife's a dentist used to do PRP in the TMJ and people asked her and so she was doing facial stuff and that helps too, but it doesn't help nearly as long or um, nearly as well. Um, autoimmune disease. Uh, most patients with autoimmune diseases get better with simple IV infusion. When specific joints are inflamed, we also inject the joint with stem cells. This is a patient from uh, uh, Chicago who we did, rheumatoid arthritis. I've had rheumatoid arthritis since 2004. With the rheumatoid, you get flares, and at times I have to have like my son or my husband open things for me, and or even reach something because it just the muscle ache and everything. I've been on you know drugs and and prednisone forever. It, it seems like since 2008, and um, it, it really is hard on your body. But I would flare. And then with the flare, then you'd have to get a shot of cortisone. I'd walk out of my appointments with six shots in my hands or in my feet, and um, it's painful. And then hopefully that works, or they'd have to put me on a high dose of prednisone, methyl prednisone packs and everything. It got to the point where it wasn't even working anymore. And so I had to go on to this Orencia, which is the mildest of the biologics. Um, it still lowers your immune system, though, and you know things can happen, but that seemed like that was helping for a while. Um, the problem is, is that I have a hard time finding a vein. It's just more maintaining, and that's what I've always said. When I, when I was told I had this disease, and I walked into somebody's office, the first doctor I ever saw, and I see these women with the deformed hands and just maintaining, and I knew I just, you know, it's like I didn't want to be in that world, although I was. My husband actually recommended Dr. Padronos to me. Um, and his friend recommended it to him. And he suggested when I had gone to um, an orthopedic and um, on, for my wrists that were really bad, I was wearing wrist brace and getting shots in them and they had gotten an x-ray and you know they said, really, your next step is getting it fused.
Dr. Padromos met with me and my mom um, for a long time, and he said that's basically not good for people, that, that's not very effective in the wrist for patients with rheumatoid, um, and brought up the stem cells and what they're doing. His credentials were just blew me out of the water when I was looking at his credentials. I thought uh, this seems like the one that would, you know, be worth a try. And I guess for me, I put it in my mind I was going to Antigua, <laughs> so I've never been there before. It was beautiful down there, just gorgeous, nice and warm. And they took care of getting our COVID um, um, test before we went back. Um, so everything, everything was just taken care of. So I got the stem cell treatment, and to be honest, it, it was, um, you know, it, it, it's a shot in the wrist and everything. And um, after that, after the wrist calmed down, I'm, I'm not on, I don't have my wrist braces on anymore. So I have that movement again. My, my shoulders aren't hurting anymore. Um, I'm walking better. I had it in my wrist. My back was continuously going out and that, you know, is prevents you from doing things. And it's, it's been in there for what, it's been like eight weeks now. So um, that, that's a ton better. I have so many friends with autoimmune diseases, friends with um, kids with autism, type one diabetes. I have been telling, I have been telling people about this. I guess that, that is the final thought. I want to see so many people healed with this that I do hope that it gets more prevalent. I do want to go do this again because I think it would give me even more benefits. So this, this was filmed at um, eight weeks. She's now two years and, um, and she's pretty much the same. I think her knees have gotten a little worse. We may do her again, uh, but, for the, but for the most part, she's still doing well after just this one time. Raynaud syndrome, um, your fingers in cold weather get red and then blue and they're stiff and they hurt, um, often part of something called scleroderma. So this lady, this young woman, um, she's 30 I think, um, you could see her fingers were all red, they were cold and they were stiff and they hurt her. And she it would come and go, but she, they'd been like this for a period of several weeks. So we injected her just IV, less pink, this is five hours later, and completely back to normal. That was January. And, she's, and she is still fine. So moving on, autism. Um, patients are treated in Antigua or Athens with simple IV stem cell infusion. We treated nine autistic patients, all improved initially. Uh, we have follow-up of more than six months on eight of them. Um, one of them improved for a month and then got worse again. He wants to come back, actually, I think. Um, we've done EEGs on them, electroencephalograms. We try to get objective data where we can, and all of them have had substantially better EEGs, calmer, indicating less stress, less chaos in their brains. Um, we're um, publishing this groundbreaking research. We're very excited about this because, you know, it's something we like to use stem cells where it's very likely to help um, and where there's much else you can do. And that is it's this because there's really no real treatment for autism. There's a lot of people with that problem. Um, so, and we've had people, we had a guy from Liverpool, a gentleman came and he wrote a nice testimonial for us. We've got someone who wants to come from Pakistan as soon as he can get a visa. We've reached out to autism societies and they've universally said they don't want to talk to us. So they're interested in pharmaceutical drugs. We get this all the time. It's, you know, it's, I'm kind of used to it now, but, um, but, but this is an area where we think we can do um, a lot of good. We had one patient who regressed after about 10 months. Um, the rest of them, we had people, our very first patients out to two years, um, he was having little absence seizures before he started and had had them periodically. And from the day we did it, they stopped almost 100%. And two years later, they're still stopped. So, and so why would it work for autism, you ask? Well, um, I think I mentioned stem cells are powerfully anti-inflammatory. Autism, we have 70 papers that indicate some sort of immune derangement with this disorder. So it's not classic autoimmune disease, but it appears that it's immune mediated. Um, the blood brain barrier when you're inflamed is more porous. So we inject these IV, they apparently make it to the brain and quiet down, you know, quiet down these, um, quiet down these neurons. Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, we've had pretty good success with this. We had one patient with ulcerative colitis, terrible case where gave him a lot of cells, did nothing. And we kind of figured out he was on big doses of cortisone. We kind of learned that if they're on big doses of anti-inflammatory, of those like chemotherapy kind of things that it's um, probably stops the stem cells from working. Um, gut inflammation. So we have people whose guts are inflamed. They have, they have 
loose stools, they may be vomiting here and there, pain in their stomach, gas and bloating and such. And we've got like seven people like this, gastroenteropathy, hard to know what to call it, including our pain specialist who, who had this. And they've all gotten better um, with IV stem cells. Um, we, we had one young gentleman, young pro athlete, 23 years old, who had been 6'1 and 205 and was down to 130. He'd lost weight, was having trouble eating, even having trouble um, with fluids. Um, difficult case to diagnose, appeared to be pancreatic insufficiency, so we brought him down there um, and um, gave him IV stem cells. A, a day later, he was tolerating fluid some. Two days later, more fluid. Started him on food, 100 calories, 200 calories. I just talked to him. This is four or five weeks ago, I think. Um, and he was up to 2,800 calories a day. He would put on 20 pounds. He's working out, lifting weights. You know, pretty, um, pretty remarkable. Um, so we are interested um, in doing more of this, even though it's hard to put an exact diagnosis on it. Although we'll see this in people that have syndromes after um, autoimmune disorders with gut disorders where they seem to get better. I had a patient who we're going to do in May was asking me who, um, do you ever see, uh, no it wasn't, it was a patient we just did, that's right, who, um, long story, is a doctor actually, and he had an upset stomach. He said, do you ever see this one of these? And I said, no, we've never seen anybody. Uh, you know, people get upset stomachs from flus and stuff, but we've seen nothing adverse for the gut ever with these cells. Long COVID Lyme disease Epstein-Barr. So people get viruses and then they get post-viral autoimmune disorders triggered by it. Um, uh, and um, we are consistently able to improve brain fog, GI symptoms, and joint aches with um, stem cell treatment. We're doing more of this now. I don't have good data yet. We, um, we review these things, but it's time consuming. I have three, three researchers doing this, but it's um, even finding people is, uh, we follow people up, but we, we have to kind of chase people down just because people are busy, whatever. But, um, but we're excited about this as well. PCOS, I mentioned, that, like the young lady, fertility endometriosis, there's evidence that it helps endometriosis. Uh, so we are looking for endometriosis in PCOS patients. Um, erectile dysfunction, 90% success when diabetes is the cause. 50% in our experience for all other causes with local injections. Uh, libido is often improved. Peyronie's disease. Peyronie's disease is a painful curvature of the penis. You know, there's some treatment for it, but we just did our first patient. Um, injected into the convexity of the curvature. We have a urologist doing these injections, by the way. Uh, so I, I inject joints, knees, shoulders, wrists, elbows. We have the world's best pain specialist, in my opinion, Ken Candido. Professor at the U of I, he's published 200 papers. I've known him forever. He's a former department chairman, very skilled. So he does all the back patients and some other specialized things. Um, and then we have a urologist who does the, um, uh, these kinds of injections. Anyway, this patient is, he's not 100% better, but I think he told us he was 50% um, better and he's happy that he's gotten better. Facial rejuvenation, so people want their skin to look better. So we do a microneedling and massaging stem cells um, into the skin, um, doesn't particularly hurt and makes skin look remarkably um, better. People do this with PRP, vampire facelifts, and my wife um, did those um, for a while when she was doing PRP into the TMJ, my wife's a dentist, and it, it helped, but it wore off pretty quickly. This seems to last a lot longer. Vaginal rejuvenation, we're just starting to do this. Um, uh, ladies, when they get older, some of them get dry, decreased vaginal secretions, and it can cause its own symptoms. It can cause pain during sex, and we've just started doing this. It's easy to do. There's a question as to whether it increases sexual pleasure, uh, O-spot, G-spot, I, I, I don't think I exactly know, but, but there's no question that it um, can increase the, um, sort of rejuvenate the vaginal mucosa. Uh, diabetes, uh, there's some new studies indicating improvement for type one or type two, um, and we've started to do that with some success. Um, asthma and COPD, we published a paper. Um, the guy that said that the penis injection didn't hurt had asthma and uh, had a, like an 80% decrease in his use of nebulizer and um, the other thing that you breathe and he's significantly out now. He got sick and then it got worse but then it got better. Um, uh, we're doing, we did one rock and roll icon who got a little better. I've got another rock and roll icon we're gonna do in another couple of months. But, um, 
but it can be helpful for asthma and COPD. Nerve injury, uh, we had a guy, 1998, he had an operation that resulted in lack of blood flow to his leg, um, and his leg from here down was completely numb, couldn't feel anything, and he had a foot drop, couldn't lift his foot up. Um, and Dr. Candido did this, this injection along the two major nerves and two major arteries under ultrasound, and while he was doing it, the guy felt some sensation in his leg, which he hadn't felt. Five days later, his sensation was completely restored, and, he, and a year later, it still is. He got, he said, about 50% of his strength back, not completely back. Trigeminal neuralgia. Um, so this is kind of an incurable, um, often incurable problem, and people have surgery for it, and it's very vexing to the people who have it. Uh, this is a testimonial from this patient Hi everyone, I'm a stem cell recipient and a patient of Dr. Pedromos. I'm 48 years old and was diagnosed with trigeminal neuralgia when I was 26. For the past two decades, I have been on a combination of different medicines to help manage my symptoms. I was a stem cell recipient in December of 2022. I am now medication free after a phase off since February of this year. It is amazing to be off of medication for the first time in over two decades. I pray that this is a lasting solution for such an awful autoimmune disease. So she's continued to do well. She got a little worse about a year later and she had to start some meds, but you see, she, you wouldn't know what to talk to her, um, but she, had, she was foggy from all these meds. And um, um, so she's on a small dose of meds now, but said far less than before. She's not foggy and still doing well. This is a very remarkable case. So Dr. Candido, who has the best hands on the planet, did a CAT scan guided under sedation. Um, it's called the foraminal valley. It's where the nerve comes out of the skull um, injection. So the lady was in a CAT scan. You advance the needle slowly, take CAT scan pictures to precisely place it. Um, and um, um, so we could get it right at the root. Um, and actually, we're, like I said, we're you know, we're write, writing up a case report with this, we're, we're gonna send in. Um, so cost, um, cost in general is about $20,000 for treatment, a little more if you're doing several different treatments, and it kind of depends. If we do autoimmune disorders, we have to give more cells. So our basic cost is $19,000 for 100 million stem cells, and then if um, we have to use more cells, we just charge for the tissue bank charges us. Uh, Dr. Candido um, gets paid to do the injections. Um, and as I think I might have mentioned here, I do peripheral joints, knees, ankles, and such. He does the back, and we have a urologist to do those kinds of things, and a gynecologist to do the uh, vaginal injection. Uh, autistic patients, sometimes it's less, because they're small people often. Um, we've done as young as four and as old as 27, but that's about the cost, and then, you know, a plane ticket in a hotel room. And, and as far as the frequency of going down this, we go to Antigua every other month. We just started going to Greece, I went a month ago, and I'm still not exactly sure how often I'm gonna go. And I don't, I don't have to be there for intravenous in, um, injections either. Some people wanna time it when I am there. So we're going in the second week in June to Greece, and again in um, September. Um, we just had a um, very prominent retired business lady um, who was down in Antigua a year ago and anti-aging and went and felt good and so she's coming back. Um, she's supposed to come back to Antigua in May, but she just canceled. She said, I want to go to Greece. So she's going to, um, she's going to Athens in uh, June. So uh, every patient we treat is part of a clinical study. We're one of the only stem cell centers that performs this research, follows up our results and publishes them. It is expensive and difficult, but it's the only way to advance the field. I have a 501c3 nonprofit. I established it 20 years ago, and we were mostly doing orthopedic stuff back then. I funded this for 20 years out of my pocket. Um, it's a six-figure investment every year that I've just paid to do this. Um, I, I pay full-time research people, salaries. There's a lot of expenses. Um, and then we find money for patients um, who need treatment and can't um, afford it. So I've mostly funded this myself. Some people have volunteered to... Uh, donate money. I gave a talk at Pelican Bay a month ago and a lady came up afterward and she said, you know, you're nuts. She said, why don't you ask people to donate? And I said, yeah, you're probably right. I just don't like asking people for money, but this time I decided I would. So let me just tell you a little more about it. Um, I want to tell you about a patient and show you an example of what we're doing. This is a little long, but bear with me on this. Um, it's a patient with arthrogryposis, arthrogryposis multiplex congenital, that's the full name. Um, this is an amazing young man. He's 22. He has a genetic condition called arthrogryposis. It produces extreme contractures of all joints. There is no cure. Most patients die in infancy. 
This young man, however, is getting a bachelor's degree and has survived into adulthood against all odds because of his will, spirit, and amazingly dedicated and supportive family. He has several healthy siblings, gymnasts, and his father's a firefighter. He's respirator dependent and his pulmonary condition is declining. Surgery to straighten his spine is his only hope. However, all the spine surgeons the family had seen over the years told him they could not help him and the surgery was too risky. Without surgery, he will likely die within a few years from his worsening lung condition. He came to us, he was referred to me, for stem cell treatment. Um, but stem cell treatment cannot help this. Um, as an orthopedic surgeon, however, I have the capacity to help him to get the um, life-saving surgical correction by pleading his case to specialist spine surgeon colleagues of mine, which after several refusals now appears at hand. There are no guarantees, but this is his only chance and he and his family want to go for it. A generous benefactor who knew about our work um, has donated $10,000 to our foundation, um, Floridian actually, which will help him, uh, help him to defray his living expenses for the four to six months that he will likely need to live in Florida where he'll probably have the surgery. He has to go and get a halo, pins put in his skull, and he gets a halo put on that wears a vest to help straighten out his spine a little bit. Then he has the surgery, then he has to do this again for a couple of more months while it heals. Um, so there's living expenses down here. And the family's amazing, but you know, they're, they're not wealthy people. So is your, your, your right hand has that implement. Um, how much are you able to do with your left hand? Well. So, so if I try to straighten it a little, really nothing. So maybe 10 degrees of motion out of again what should be 130. There's a, a wound which we have some separate pictures of from shoulder is here and then there's a wound under here. From the bed to the chair, or in this case to the exam table, then you um, pick him up and carry him, I think. So just kind of show us a little um, what this entails. Lay him out to the exam table. So here we go. You got your, um, your, they're now shorts on. So knees don't really straighten, but there's some, yeah. Uh, feet or club, so your toes move a little, but not really your ankles, right? No. Um, I'm gonna try to move your knee just a little. Sure. Let's see what happens, if anything. So that's about it, yeah. just a little motion. So Calvin, your parents said you're a man of, of several passions. I guess one of them is the Chicago Blackhawks. Yes. And uh, big hockey guy? Yes, I love hockey. I love Disney, yeah. Disney World, yeah. Disneyland. Yeah. I love Taco Bell. Taco Bell, there you go. Good whole food. Yes. And uh, and Taylor Swift too, huh? Yeah, friends. I am just just an amazing guy, and ama even more amazing family. So um, donations to large university medical centers often are used to build buildings and to fund animal research that does not directly benefit patients. Overhead is often substantial. Uh, a donation to our foundation directly pays for patients like this one who need care but cannot afford it. It also directly pays the salaries of researchers who uh, perform this research. Uh, we have no overhead siphoning this funds. I don't take any kind of salary from it. Um, so if you have an interest in donating, please talk to me afterward or indicate your interest on our form and we will call you. I have you know, a lot of affluent patients here who want to do the right thing and you figure you donate to a big institution and nothing against big institutions. Um, however, um, you know, this is a way to directly help people. We're, we're right at the front lines. And there's the research beyond what I'm talking about here too. Um, Parkinson's, we're doing an exosome study uh, at no cost to people actually to maybe help in ways that we otherwise. Thank you all for, um, for your attention.